Welcome back to Jenny Designs with Paper and this week's episode of Crime and Coloring, where we take an alphabetical journey through the United States and revisit some of the earlier crimes. But before we talk crime, let's talk coloring. Today I will be using Simon Says Stamp Intense Black Ink and Nina Classic Crest Solar White 80 pound cardstock to stamp some images from my stash. I'm using some old Stampin' Up! sets and I'm going to make three cards with these very sketchy drawings of women. I will be coloring them with Copic markers and colors I've selected to match some pattern paper from um, a My Mind's Eye or Cartabella paper pad. I can't remember which one, but I will show you with the, after all the coloring is done. And um, a couple of word dies to finish off the sentiments. So now that we've talked about the coloring, let's jump into the crime. The land that became the state of Iowa was part of the Louisiana Purchase. On December 28, 1846, Iowa became the 29th state in the Union when President James Polk signed Iowa's admission bill into law. Iowa. I emphasized the wrong syllable there. In the state of Iowa, it is illegal for a mustached man to kiss a woman in public. Iowa is home to the National Hobo Convention. Riverside, Iowa enjoys the unique status of being the future birthplace of one James Tiberius Kirk, captain of the starship USS Enterprise. For you truckies out there, John Wayne, a.k.a. the Duke, was born in Iowa. Iowa is also the birthplace of sliced bread. Um, when an Iowa boy was in the candy store and could not decide whether or not to spend his money on ice cream or a chocolate bar, an idea was born, and a year later, we welcomed the Eskimo pie. In Iowa, hogs outnumber humans four to one, and with approximately three million people living in the state, that's a lot of pigs. Iowa lays claim to the world's largest wooden nickel that is 12 feet across and sits in a, in a city farm, Iowa City Farm. And Iowa is a place where premonition is followed by murder. We are going to start our story today with Lyman Alger. Lyman was the son of Sorrel and Polly Alger and was born on September 12, 1800 in Madison County, New York. When his parents were seven, they moved to Erie County, I think New York. And then at the age of 21, Lyman moved to Pennsylvania, only to return a year later. Now, I don't know if it was for school or work or just for fun, but upon his return to Erie County, Lyman married Dorcas Hawkins. Lyman and Dorcas were the parents of five children. It seems the oldest was about five when his parents got married, though, according to the birth records I found. And their youngest child um, died at birth. In 1836, Lyman moved to Clinton County, Iowa, he made a claim and built a cabin, and then in the spring of 1838, moved his family there. Sadly, on the 14th of August, 1839, Dorcas died. Fast forward a few months to November 2nd, 1840, so, you know, a little over a year, Lyman married his brother's widow, Martha. Martha and her first husband, Sarah, didn't have any children before Sarah passed away in 1839. Um, Delois Alger was born to Lyman and Martha on the 16th of March, 1841, so not quite nine months after they got married. And more sadness followed when Martha died on May 21st, 1841, just a few weeks after the birth of her daughter. On the 14th of August, 1841 like May to August, Lyman married Esther Burton, widow of Spooner P. Burton, and sister to his first wife, Dorcas. Lyman and Esther had no children. Now, Lyman's mester to Erich would be his longest. The Algers were the most prosperous people in the area, owning 700 acres in Olive Township. They raised crops, they sold cattle, and also owned land in other parts of the state. Esther and Lyman Alger lived on the road from Calamus to Buena Vista Ferry in a house described as a mansion sitting near the road at just at the edge of the timber that, that um, stood along the banks of the Wapsie, Wapsie River. I'm butchering that, I'm sure. Now, Esther Hawkins Alger was born on July 9th in 1800 in New York, probably Erie County, 
And she had one sister named Dorcas, who was her husband Lyman's first wife. In April of 1820, Esther married Spooner Burton, and they bought 40 acres in Clinton County, making them some of the very first earliest, earliest settlers of the area. Sadly, Spooner and Esther had no children. Spooner Burton died sometime before 1841. I couldn't find an exact birth date, just a year, leaving Esther a, a kind of young widow. And then in August of 1841, Esther married her former brother-in-law, Lyman, um, three months after the death of his second wife, just in case you were not mathing ahead back there. Esther moved on to Lyman's large farm and became the matriarch of an extended Alger family, even though the two of them had no children of their own. Now, Lyman and Esther had, like I said, a very large extended family, and they were. this was the product of Lyman's multiple marriages. There were children from his first two marriages, grandchildren, and the family lived close in contact to um, other families in the area. One of the other families was the Curtis family, and the Curtis family merged with the Algers family when Lyman's um, oldest daughter, Maria, married the farmer, Reverend DeWitt Curtis, and they had five children. Um, DeWitt actually was married two more times and had two more children, and DeWitt himself was one of 18 children. So between the Alger and the Curtis families, they nearly populated the entire township in and of themselves. Okay, now that the background has been established, we get to start to the story, we get to the heart of our story. Around 7 p.m. on Wednesday, September 25th, 1872, Lyman left his home for a prayer meeting being conducted by his son-in-law, DeWitt, at a schoolhouse that was about a quarter mile away from his home. Not wanting to leave Esther alone for a reason I could not find, like nobody wrote down why, Lyman asked his 19-year-old grandson, Lyman Judd, Judson Curtis, a.k.a. Judd, um, he was the son of Marjorie and DeWitt, to stay with his step-grandmother. Nobody knows exactly what happened after that because the only on-record version of events we have come from Judd. However, according to Judd, not long after his grandfather left for the prayer meeting, he decided to go back home to his dad's house, leaving Grandma Esther alone. Now, if Granddad had wanted her to have company, he's being a very unhelpful grandson leaving there alone. And again, I don't know why they didn't want Esther to be home alone. Maybe she was ill. Maybe she was, I don't know. However, Judd claimed that just as he was nearly home, and his home was just more than like 260-something yards away from his grandparents' home, he heard a gunshot, so he rushed back toward his grandparents' home. As he ran toward the house, Judd claimed that he stumbled over something that he could not see. And when he got inside their home, it was dark and the rooms were empty and the lamp was the only thing he could see. And by the lamplight, he could tell there was blood on the floor. Judd said he ran back outside and only then realized what he had stumbled over before on the way into the house was his step-grandmother, Esther lying on the ground near the side of the house. Judd said he called her name, spoke to her, but she did not respond. And then he ran his hands over her face and felt something wet. So then Judd runs toward the schoolhouse where the prayer meeting is occurring, screaming for help. And everyone at the prayer meeting, including Lyman, rushed back with him to the Alger farm. The men finding Esther upon the ground, carry her body into the home. And in the lamplight, they could see that the top and the back of her head had been badly battered. And it seemed like to them that she was losing gray matter from her skull. There was also a bullet hole in the left side of her chest. It seemed, according to the people there, that Esther had been shot in the house. And when she ran into the yard, the murderer overtook her and struck her on the head 
and one report said over 20 times. Then, then the murderer was able to sneak back into the house, hide the recently fired rifle, and get away. And all of this took, ta took place in less time than it took for Judd to walk from his, home, his grandparents' home to his home, which was, again, just over 260 yards. Now, I don't know how fast you have to walk to make that, but, but, it was determined that $1,100 from the sale of cattle the day before, some of it in gold, was missing from a dresser drawer in a room next to the one where Esther was sitting when Lyman left for church. Then, then, get this, then Judd made an announcement. He said he dreamed a dream three times the night before, and it was the same dream. And in that dream, he dreamed that his step-grandmother was murdered and $1,500 was stolen from a trunk in the house. I know. Now we all know who did it, right? I mean, if you are a true crime aficionado, if you like the mysteries, if you've ever watched any episode of Dateline, you probably think you know who did it. However... According to the DeWitt Observer, notice the name, this is the newspaper in town, the investigation of Esther's brutal murder and the robbery of the house was bungled from the very beginning. Two men were arrested, questioned, and found to have not even been in the community at the time of the murder, so they were released. After that, of course, Suspicion immediately comes to the family, right? Which was kind of where it should have started. In the spring of 1874, 39-year-old Nathan Curtis and his half-nephew, 21-year-old Judd, were arrested for the murder by Constable E.K. Wood of DeWitt, the town of DeWitt or county of DeWitt. This is two years after Esther's, Esther's murder. In June of 1874, a grand jury was convened to decide whether or not to indict Curtis and Judd. Sorry, Nathan and Judd, the Curtis men. So the DeWitt Observer was the local newspaper, as I said, and it became the point of information for other newspapers in and out of the area. And it was stated that the Observer merciless, mercilessly pursued the murderer, acting as the voice for poor dead Esther. The editors made no secret that they believed that Judd and Nate Curtis were involved and they used the newspaper to point out these inconsistencies in Judd Curtis's story. They claimed that one, Judd gave conflicting accounts of how far away he was from the house when he heard the gunshot. Um, two, that the recently fired rifle was found, or sorry, when the rifle was found, Judd claimed his father shot a rooster with it. His father, DeWitt Curtis, who was leading the prayer meeting in front of a bunch of people, obviously denied that. So then how did the gun discharge? Three, if the killer or killers were lurking nearby waiting for an opportunity to kill Esther and rob the house, why did they shoot her, follow her into the yard, beat her up, then take the time to go back to the house and hide the gun? And four, and of course, there was Judd's alleged dream of Esther being murdered. Now, the Observer also had a case against Nathan Curtis, and they printed their, their opinion there as well. Um, Nathan Curtis's clothing was blood splattered, but he claimed that he never touched Esther's body or helped carry her into the house. Um, Nathan, or Nate, as he went by, was said to have bribed witnesses to prove he was somewhere else at the time of the murder, and he did it so well he had three different alibis. He was... He was absolutely in three different places at the same time. There was a man named De Delos Barod. He was Alman's grandson. And um, he told Constable Wood that he knew who killed Esther, but had been threatened by death if he said who it was. And he specifically said that Nate Curtis wrote him a letter saying to keep his mouth shut. He also claimed to know where the money was buried. And every time he walked past it, it made him feel guilty about what he knew. Nate Curtis had some unusual financial dealings with a distant relative, um, a man named Brookman. 
from Erie County, New York. Ruckman was described as a poor, ignorant, thriftless man. And he claimed while he was in New York that his relative Nate was ill with typhoid fever. So he borrowed money in New York to travel to Iowa to visit Nate. And then he gets to Iowa. He's not surprised at all that Nate's not sick. And he goes back to New York. He repaid the money that he borrowed to travel to Iowa. Also bought a buggy and a wagon and a harness and paid off his mortgage, $1,300 in total. So Brookman also bought some real estate in New York State for Nate Curtis, who was planning to move there. It was impossible to see where a man like Brookman would have gotten all that money. Did he get it from Nate Curtis, who stole it from the Algiers, and was and so he was laundering it through Brookman? Um, was this how Nate Curtis was going to leave New York, or leave Iowa and live in New York? way far away from the murder scene. Who knows? Here's what we do know. The grand jury did not, capital N, capital O, capital T, indict Judd and Nate Curtis. Before the grand jury even convened, citizens in the area wondered if an impartial jury could even be found, even if the grand jury was moved to another town because people were so highly charged by this murder and it was so public. It was reported that it was impossible for the grand jury to sort out contradictions between the account and the multiple alibis of the suspect. Most of those alibis have been provided by family members. So Esther's 73-year-old husband Lyman refused to believe that any of his family members were involved and he swore that his grandson Judd was in five different places in the house before the prayer meeting. Lyman gave so many conflicting accounts of the events that his word became worthless and some speculated that he was becoming senile. Um, the Jackson Sentinel and the DeWitt Observer wrote, quote, Lyman Alger is either an irresponsible daughter or a perjured old wretch. And they said, quote, but if he is in his dotage, how does he manage to be so clear headed in all manners, throwing suspicion and contempt on outside parties? That conundrum beats us. Mr. Alger is even now making arrangements to hunt down no less than three other persons for the murder who are as innocent of the crime as we are, and we have never been within three miles of this place. He went to New York State, don't know whether it was whether he went to Brookman or not, and was told by a fortune teller wizard or witch that three certain men did the work of the murdering of his wife. Now the county is to be put to the expense of three more prosecutions and hoodwinkings, end quote. I don't know what Lyman's got going on. I don't know if he's, like they said, going senile or if he just could not bear the thought that his grandson would murder his wife. I don't know. However, soon after the murder and the grand jury. Nathan Curtis and his wife Mary moved their four children to Harding County and he died sometime after the 1910 census. He does not appear on the 1920 census. And um, Judd Curtis um, did, was said to quote extensively travel after his stepmother's murder. He did return to Clinton County and he married a woman named Grace Rector in July of 1884. So that's like 10 years after the grand jury. And they had a daughter named Blanche. Um, Judd died in 1933 at the age of 79 and is buried in the Rose Hill Cemetery near Calamus. There were rumors that Lyman was aware of his grandson's involvement in Esther's murder and donated money to build the Free Will Baptist Church to ease his conscience. And now, a little tidbit of information, just because this is not frustrating and irritating and odd enough. In February of 1874, so this is the two years after Esther's death and the year of the grand jury in Long Grove, which was about 15 miles southwest of the Alger farm, 32 year old Elizabeth Brownlee and her four year old son Andrew were shot and killed in their home. Their murders, like that of Esther Alger's, are unsolved. Many believe the same killers were at work in that murder. 
on reporting on the Brownlee murders, the De DeWitt Observer encouraged the community to find the guilty parties, but was less than hopeful that that would be done by, and this is their quote, after the Alger murder, there was for a time a considerable mock eagerness in trying to ferret it out. And a few arrests were made of perfectly innocent persons. And all the while, to this day, the finger of the community pointed to a man as the guilty one right in the neighborhood, and he goes scot-free. So it seems that the editor of the newspaper, the editors of the newspaper, at the very least, were 100% convinced that Judd was the killer of his step-grandmother. I did not read where they offered any um, suspected motive, or any um, insight into Judd himself. Like, was he a troubled child? Was he, was this way outside his norm? It seems like to me in my brain, if they were ready to believe that he was the one based on circumstances, then most likely he wasn't a squeaky clean kid, right? If he had never had any trouble with anybody ever, then probably they would have had a harder time believing he was capable of killing his step-grandmother. But, and here is the thoughts of Jenny on the subject. Lyman had three wives. All two of them died young. I did not find any indication that they died of anything other than natural causes. In fact, it seems likely based on the timing that a second wife may have died from complications to childbirth. But Lyman had three wives. Two of them died. And did nobody question that because he was Lyman Algers and he was the first man in the community and he owned half of the area and all of the people who lived there were related to him? I mean, my brain goes some dark places sometimes, but I got to wonder. His second wife, he married within months of his worth, or sorry, he within months of marrying his second wife, their daughter was born. But based on marriage and birth records, she was clearly conceived before their wedding. And he married her within months of the death of his first wife. So I don't know. It feels like a little soap opera me eat soap opera e to me, if that's an actual adjective. I feel like maybe somebody should have been investigating Lyman just a little bit more. Did he hire somebody? I mean, this cousin, this this long distance or you know mildly related cousin that shows up and then goes back to New York flush with cash. I mean, I'm just saying. And then Lyman takes a trip to New York. I'm just saying. It seems like maybe they should have been less concerned about protecting the community and more concerned about finding Esther's murder. I agree with the newspaper editors. There was not enough done. This is a picture of Lyman. I like that beard that comes down off his chin. It's so weird. This is a picture of Esther. And I do have a clip of a picture of her death notice or her murder notice in the paper. Thanks for hanging out with me today. I hope you enjoyed our story. I have a couple of other videos here that I think you might like. I've also added that subscribe button. If you have not yet subscribed to my channel, I would love it if you did. Give me a comment down below. Who do you think did it? Leave me a thumbs up if you like the story and have a really great day.